Among all these groups, one arose specifically to challenge discrimination. In the early part of the 20th century, the postal associations, like many craft unions, excluded African Americans. In 1913, 35 African American railway mail clerks met at the foot of Lookout Mountain in Chattanooga, Tennessee, to form their own organization. Their immediate goal was to prevent the elimination of African Americans from the railway mail service and to thwart the efforts of President Woodrow Wilson's administration to put all African American railway clerks on a separate run. They called their new organization the National Alliance of Postal Employees. In time, it expanded to become the National Alliance of Postal and Federal Employees. Since 1913, the NAPFE has been open to all eligible persons regardless of race, sex, nationality, or religion, and it has played an important role in challenging oppression and fostering solidarity. American workers put a strong advocate in the White House when they elected President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who championed a new deal for the country. On August 14, 1935, Congress passed legislation creating the 40-hour workweek for postal employees, three years before the Fair Labor Standards Act granting that protection to most U.S. workers. In 1962, President John F. Kennedy signed an executive order giving limited bargaining rights to federal government employees, including members of seven postal unions. Kennedy's action was welcome news, but postal employees wanted more. On March 18, 1970, thousands of postal workers walked off the job. They were taking an enormous risk, engaging in an illegal strike. Despite the use of the National Guard, the walkout could not be contained and ultimately involved more than 200,000 postal workers in 671 locations. Mail service ground to a halt. Faced with this overwhelming show of solidarity, Postmaster General Winton Blount agreed to negotiate with the seven postal unions when the employees returned to work. They did, and an agreement was reached in April 1970. A few months later, on August 12, 1970, President Richard Nixon signed the Postal Reorganization Act, restructuring the Postal Service and forever changing the future for postal workers. No longer would wage increases be dependent on the whims of Congress. Instead, postal unions would have full rights to negotiate over wages, benefits, and working conditions. In lieu of the right to strike, disputes would be submitted to binding arbitration. AFL-CIO President George Meany played a crucial role in securing passage of the Postal Reorganization Act. In the first contract achieved after the strike, a starting postal worker's salary was raised to about $8,400 a year slightly more than a 21-year employee had been getting just three years earlier. July 1st, 1971. After decades of division among postal employees, five major unions came together to form the American Postal Workers Union. They included the union representing workers who serviced and repaired machines located in postal facilities, and the union for those who drove, repaired and serviced other Postal Service vehicles, and the Organization for Special Delivery Messengers. The largest union, the UFPC, represented those who worked the windows at post offices and who sorted and processed mail behind the scenes. The National Postal Union, formed by progressives in 1958, had members across various classifications. Both traced their origin to the National Federation of Postal Clerks created in Chicago back in 1906. The former craft unions and NPU live on in the APWU. In the last few decades, the APWU has been in the forefront in promoting diversity in the labor movement by electing women and minorities to positions of leadership and creating power, post office women for equal rights, by advocating for the rights of the hearing impaired, by speaking out for the creation of a holiday honoring the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. All the while working hard to improve the lives of APWU members and standing up for other workers when they are under attack. Throughout our history, postal workers have benefited from the hard work and vision of local and national leaders. 
these men and women emerged from the ranks at critical times to create and guide their organizations through decades of struggle. They have been our advocates in the halls of Congress and on the picket line, at the bargaining table, and at the historic meetings to unify postal employees and create the world's largest postal union. Today's challenges are different, but no less daunting than those facing postal workers 100 years ago. On Capitol Hill, anti-worker politicians continue their efforts to reform the nation's mail system and undermine the quality of service for customers, the rights of employees, and the efforts of our predecessors. Postal service management is pushing an aggressive network development process to consolidate operations. APWU members across the country are mobilizing on behalf of candidates who support working families in this fall's very important congressional and state elections. All of this is taking place in the context of bargaining. The current agreement, extended in 2002 and again last summer, is set to expire on November 20th of this year. To succeed in the face of these challenges, the APWU will draw on the strength solidarity of its membership and its legacy of 100 years of progress. <laughs> 